and that we were successfully able to improve their glucose control down to 6.5% in the intensive arm patients. I'd like to propose to you that you do not expect or you, you should not need to look for the inverted hockey stick or the Nike sign that we have all learned from the UK PDS to say, if you have diabetes and you've had diabetes for many years, expect to lose control. This has not been the case. In advance, you will recognize the similar kind of curve with a cord as well as BADT. So you can actually flatten them out. It is not something that you have to say, oh, sure, will happen one. You know, don't expect these patients to actually uh, get better control the longer you've had diabetes. You do not need to see that loss of control. And it is possible with a lot of work between yourself and the patient. So what was the outcome? As Professor Cooper has mentioned, the outcomes were largely nephropathy. And I'd like to review in more depth with you what was the benefit of improving this glucose control. There was less, maybe I should use the, the mouse, can I see the mouse? Okay, new microalbuminuria, less by 9%. New macroalbuminuria, meaning moving from micro to macroalbuminuria, reduction by 30%. And in terms of new and worsening nephropathy, reduction by a massive 20%. So if you and I believe that if I can prevent this person moving across in terms of progression of nephropathy, and once they have renal impairment and renal failure, that what they are likely to actually expect in the future is renal replacement therapy, such as transplantation or dialysis, but most of all, an expectation of premature mortality. What do these patients with renal impairment and failure die of? They don't necessarily die of renal failure these days because of the advent of having dialysis centers. Maybe Myanmar might have less options, but certainly many of us have the option to dialyze our patients. They actually succumb to cardiovascular mortality, not so much the renal failure. So this is the data that I'd like to show you in more graphic manner that in patients who are able to achieve intensive glucose control at 6.5%, we actually had more patients regressing from microalbuminuria to normal albuminuria, 20%, highly significant. In terms of, therefore, the cardiovascular impact, what do I expect from this kind of improvement? Perhaps we can expect a better cardiovascular outcome, even though we don't have the mortality statistics to confirm it. This is the data again from the advance. This is looking at hazard ratio for cardiovascular events and mortality, and this is micro or macroalbuminuria or status of albuminuria, moving from normal to micro to macro, and you will see a higher mortality in terms of hazard ratio, the higher the amount of albuminuria. This is at baseline at the time that they were recruited, and this is during follow-up at the time the, the study ended. So if you think 20% of these patients move from micro to normal albuminuria, this is what we would have benefited the patient in terms of moving from microalbuminuria has a ratio of almost three-fold higher risk down to this normal albuminuria. If you just calculate it as an arithmetical kind of uh, method, 2.8-fold higher now down to about 1.6-fold higher hazard ratio. So I think I can be confident that if I actually prevent the patient progressing and if I can be lucky enough to prevent them from and get them to regress to normal albuminuria, you would have benefited them in terms of less cardiovascular disease rates. The next, of course, is you will ask is, is it a problem? Do I see diabetic nephropathy as a problem in my patients with type 2 diabetes? How does it affect patients needing dialysis? This is very recent data, 2010, and some Singapore data also in 2010, and I put them all the Asian countries in, uh, in this slide. You will see the incident end-stage renal failure requiring dialysis due to diabetes. You know I'm from Malaysia. 
So me and Singapore, we have friendly rivalry. Okay? So Malaysia is second now in terms of numbers of patients needing dialysis at about 55%, while in Singapore, they have overtaken me already at 62%. This is a championship I let them win. <laughs> okay. Next, is renal disease a problem seen in our patients? And I'd like to show you and focus your attention on the middle panel. This is the advanced trial, and these are the different cohorts of patients showing how it is affected in terms of nephropathy. In the red line are patients in the Asian cohort. In the green line, established markets, which is um, UK, Australia, and in the blue line, patients in Eastern Europe. And you will recognize the red line is most prominent, highest in patients with stroke, in patients developing nephropathy. So in Asia, the data is so clear. Diabetes causes renal disease, renal impairment, nephropathy, end-stage renal failure. The data from advanced confirms it. So if, if, if anything, if I improve their glucose control, I hope that I will diminish this event rate downwards. Right? So what else do we learn from this very important trial? As I've said, and as Professor Cooper says, we have a large number of Asians. Many of us are brought up on the ideology that the longer you have had diabetes, in terms of duration of diabetes, beta cells are all getting lost, so you will need insulin. Let's look at the data from advanced. Duration of diabetes, does it mean that all of them have to have insulin? What about body mass index? We think that if they're thinner, they're slimmer, that they will not respond to saponaria. What about age? Let's look at the results from the advanced. This is HbA1c from the baseline moving towards final visit, the efficacy in terms of A1c reduction. Let's look at the effect and influence of age. This is the oldest cohort, more than 75. This is the youngest cohort at less than 65. And you will see that whatever age, there is improvement of glucose control as using the HbA1c as a correlate. Some of you might be thinking, hey, it looks like it's more effective in the younger patients. I'd like to look at the details a little bit more. The baseline at which these patients started off with is different. The patients who were older, more than 75 years of age, had a baseline A1C of 7.2. By the time you reduce them by a mean of 0.6, they end up with an A1C of 6.6. .6. That's not bad at all. When you start off with the A1C of 7.6, .6, dropping them by 1%, they end up at 6.6 .6 as well. So irrespective of age, sulfonylurea arm in this intensively treated patients in the advanced study was able to get patients to 6.6 .6 or thereabouts with sulfonylurea therapy. What about body mass index? Very similar data to show significant impact irrespective of whether they are obese or whether they have normal weight. So again, irrespective of body mass index, sulfonylureas here have been shown to be effective at improving glucose control. What about diabetes duration? That's something that you and I have to focus on. Longer than 10 years duration, less than five years duration of diabetes prior to being recruited into the study and you will see significant improvements. Again, the baselines are different. They will end up with very similar A1C. The most important I think you and I will focus on is this, which means that even if the patient has diabetes for more than 10 years, you don't have to say, give up. Saponaurus won't work. You can actually still have improvement, benefit, and reduction of glucose control or improvement of A1C in patients with duration of diabetes longer than 10 years. This slide is to remind me that even if you start at the baseline of A1C that looks as if the patient might require insulin, that's been in all the guidelines you see. I'm sure you also have similar guidelines as well. That when you have a patient whose A1C starts off at 11% or higher, this is an individual you must think, ah, insulin. But look at the patients in the intensively treated patient group. You will see 11% drop by about 4%. These individuals end up with an A1C of about 7%.
So again, irrespective of age, BMI, duration of diabetes, and the baseline A1C, there is still some opportunity to improve glycemic control without having to resort to insulin all the time. Now let's address the issues of hypoglycemia and weight gain. This is a table that many of you might have seen comparing the data from Accord versus Advance. Let's focus on these two lines. Looking particularly at weight gain here first because I'll show you in the next slide the major hypoglycemic events. Patients in Accord gained a whole lot of weight because they were given a whole a lot of insulin therapy in these patients on the intensively treated patient arm. 3.5 average, and in fact we were told that 20, more than 28% gained more than 10 kg in patients and versus the standard arm of 0 0.4. While in the advanced study, there was no weight gain, significant weight gain at all. And this was a big surprise to me, right? But you must imagine, this is 11,000 patients, it's not something you can manufacture. The, you do not need to have significant weight gain when using a sulfonylurea. With regards to hypoglycemia, this is the three major trials that you will be familiar with. The advanced, ACCORD, and VADT. In the gray are the intensively treated patients in each of these trials. And you will recognize that the advanced trial has the least prevalence of hypoglycemia compared to the other two. So again, achievement of A1C here, achievement was 6.5. In ACCORD was achievement 6.4. In VADT, 6.9 mean A1C. And these were the differential rates of severe hypoglycemia. So it again illustrates you do not necessarily need to see a lot of severe hypoglycemia if you do it properly. Last but not least, I have a significant number of people in Malaysia who are Muslim. One month in a year, they undergo fasting. And with sulfonylureas, we worry about hypoglycemia during the time that they don't, cannot eat. This study was actually sponsored by Merck, Sharp & Dome because they are the makers of sitagliptin. They compared the use of sitagliptin versus patients who were on con continued sulfonylurea use. This was all performed in the Middle East. This is the outcome. Sitagliptin in this arm, about 500. Sulfonylurea in this arm. And you will recognize that yes, sulfonylurea had a higher incidence of hypoglycemia, about twice more, 18% versus 9% compared to sitagliptin. Severe hypoglycemia requiring assistance 0.8 versus 0.2. Which were the sulfonylureas that were studied? Three type, all three, glibenclamide, glimepiride, and glicozide. You will recognize this as deodyl, amaryl, and dimicron. But the key result that I'd like to focus your attention on is the fact that their conclusion showed that the incidence of hypoglycemia was lower with glycoside relative to the other sulfonylureas and similar to sitagliptin. That was very interesting. This was not commissioned by Servier, but they found very similar hypoglycemia compared to sitagliptin. And the other two drugs, the longer-acting glibenclamide, not a surprise, but the surprise that emeril was associated with higher incidence of hypoglycemia compared to glycoside. So now the next question that you must be thinking, are there any differential effects depending on what type of sulfonylurea you use? I've separated these four. Glibenclamide is the first generation, extremely long acting. This is second generation and I've spoken to you about it. Is there any differential in terms of hypoglycemic risk with each of these drugs? I would suggest the answer is yes, that they are not all the same. Half-life will, of course, impact on risk of hypoglycemia. Glibenclamide having an extremely long half-life will have the highest risk for hypoglycemia. What else can impact on risk of hypoglycemia? It's the metabolites that will impact on the risk. 
We know that metabolites of glibenclamide, metabolites of glimepiride or amaryl still have metabolically active potential, meaning the, met the metabolites of these drugs still can stimulate the, the beta cell to produce insulin. So therefore, prolongation of its effect even though patients have renal impairment, particularly when they have renal impairment. However, the metabolites of glycoside and glipizide are not metabolically active and therefore do not uh, potentiate the hypoglycemic potential and once it undergoes metabolism, this drug is no longer active. And therefore you can understand that patients who have renal impairment, that they will have less hypoglycemic risk in these patients treated with glycoside or glipizide. As a sulfonylurea, glipizide is slightly less effective than the others. Is there any evidence to show the, the hypoglycemic potential of differential sulfonylureas? In this guide study performed in Europe, you will see the differential effects depending on creatinine clearance. More than 80 versus less than 50, and you will see that in the gray, the patients treated with glimepiride have a significantly higher number of patients who develop significant hypoglycemia below 3 millimoles compared to patients to patients on glipizide MR. Okay, so the evidence is there that you have less hypoglycemic potential, largely again from what I've discussed with you in terms of the metabolism of these drugs. So last but not least, how do I choose? When do I use what drugs? Of course, I think it's very easy if I were to illustrate it in this manner. If you have a patient looking like this, compared to a person who looks like this, both of whom are diabetic, I'm sure you agree with me that they don't necessarily have the same therapies. I just want to show you, this is the, one of the most famous uh, people with type 2 diabetes. This is a patient of mine with type 2 diabetes, famous in Malaysia, but you may not know her. Again, it, compare that with another group who have got normal body mass index. So end up with two patients that I'd like to share with you. Relatively young, common problem that you and I see, type 2 diabetes occurring in a younger patient. Type 2 diabetes for three years, body mass index, 25 kilograms, have a bit of hypertension, dyslipidemia, very well treated, no diabetic complications. So now this is the result that I'm faced with. Random glucose of 10 patients HbA1c is 8.4. My question to you is what would be the second drug that you would add to the patient? I hope many of you will say I will add, yeah? You won't say go home, you're well. Will any of you say go home, you're well? Hopefully not. Okay, let me do an ABCD for you. you make you guys work, right? How many of you would think metformin is not at the full dose? The full dose of metformin is actually one, uh, three tablets of 850. How many of you would just say, increase the metformin to three tablets a day, it'll do the trick? How many of you, hands up? No hands, all right? How many of you would add sulfonylurea, like dimicron MR? How many of you? Wait, someone? Okay, how many of you would choose a DPP-4 inhibitor? Hands up. You have it available. I know you have it available. <laughs> one hand, one. Okay, how many of you would add insulin? Hands up. Bedtime insulin. The rest of you, not going to do anything to this patient now. Go and send him home. <laughs> Hopefully not, lah. Huh? Okay, it's up to you. I think I would choose B because I think in our scenario, sulfonylurea is very easy to avail available, and I think uh, cost effectiveness, and in this patient, I don't think I'll have worry in terms of causing hypoglycemia. Show you a second patient that I'm starting to see more commonly now. Seven years of diabetes referred to me for poor glucose control. You look at his height and weight, 72 versus a height of 165, now on maximum metformin. DPP-4 inhibitor, I, do, I just choose any one. One tablet is maximum for this drug. Comes to me with A1C running over the last one year between 8 to 8.5%. Okay? What will you add next? He's on two already, metformin and an oral DPP-4 inhibitor. I've calculated the BMI for you. BMI 26. 
Okay? Not thin, not big. Okay, your options. How many of you would knock him on the head and say, lose some more weight? Go and exercise. Five times a week, every day a week. How many? No hands. How many of you would add the sulfonyl urea? Alright, what I did, this is a real patient. What I did, I chose to add Niclazide MR. I made him do home monitoring. I added here, already on diet and exercise, okay? He's already exercising till he's blue in the face and all that. Increased his dimicron MR to the maximum of 120 milligrams daily over a two month period because he was doing his home monitoring. How many of you would predict his A1C? Okay, now, no, I got time, I got time, is it? Go on. Right, how many of you say the A1C is going down to 7%? Hands up. Okay, how many of you would say his A1C would have gone down to 7.5%? Hands up. How many of you say go down to 6.5%? Okay, not bad. It went down to 6.6 to 7%. So not too bad. Remember, we have type 2 diabetics that are not grossly overweight, and if you don't give them something that will address the beta cell, you have drugs that uh, you know, they can add on to the DPP-4 inhibitor and get them to better control. So remember, it's not wrong to actually add these, these drugs on the, to the patient to uh, try and achieve glucose control. So look, uh, the practice guidelines, Professor Cooper has shown you this, and to consider that sulfonylurea is still very important in our treatment regimen for our patients. And my take home message is sulfonylurea have been proven to be effective. The outcome trials have shown us, UKPDS has shown us, uh, the advanced trial has shown us, even the ACCORD uh, has shown microvascular protection, decreasing complications. The advanced using glycolazide MR as the drug in the intensive arm shows that you can achieve glucose control without causing a lot of hypoglycemia, without causing a lot of weight gain. It can be effective irrespective of age, body mass index, and duration of diabetes. And if you are able to successfully get them to glucose control, you will decrease their microvascular re re what, result or outcomes or event rates with regards to protecting the kidney. I would propose to you that not all somnarias are the same. And if you and I believe that the complications of diabetes is due to overexposure to glucose, perhaps adversely like this, all right? Please cover it up and don't fight how to do it. You know, just get it done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chan, for your very uh, informative and very enlightening lectures. Uh, before we start, uh, Q&A section, may I invite both the speaker, Professor Cooper and Professor Chan, to join with us on the podium. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have already listened to the discussion by two eminent speakers. Professor Cooper has dealt with the, uh, the, the issues of uh, setting the goal for the glycemic uh, control, and he has also mentioned about the uh, new idea of guideline. And Price of submarine as well. And Professor Aspi Chen has also uh, pointed out uh, the rule of submarine urea and the correct and optimal choice of uh, submarine urea. Although the lectures are very comprehensive and very clear and vivid, there can still be room for clarification, suggestion, or questions. So this is now the time for question and answer session. And ladies and gentlemen, the occasion, this podium is occasion is graced by the presence of our renowned teachers, Professor Mama Wynn, who was the teacher to all the senior physicians, and who was the uh, great teacher for us, and who was director general, former director general of the uh, medical department of medical science, and now currently the parliamentarian in the sort of so. Um, I will request my teacher to start the ball rolling of the question and answer session. Shai, would you like to give some remark or raise question? Please. Previously, I think for the last 33 and a half years, I have been a clinician. And later on, I move on. And naturally, even since those times, we have seen a lot of diabetic patients. 
and it is a disease that we have to be struggling with even up to now. And when we were students in the textbook of Gibson that we have followed uh, throughout our teaching career, they said once upon a time, if you know syphilis, you know medicine in the days of our teachers. And then they changed and said, if you try to do diabetes, you know medicine. So trying to emphasize the fact that a diabetes is can be very complicated, very intense, intense, and in fact, uh, a very far-reaching condition that can affect and involve any system within the body, particularly where there are blood vessels. And uh, we have been struggling with all kinds of uh, treatments that we intend to have uh, the effective results on the patients. But as you are very nicely pointed out, both, both of our distinguished lecturers, professors, as nicely pointed out, academic information on one side is very important, very important. For example, Professor Chan has very nicely given to us very important messages. Sometimes we think certain things are right. But with further research, experience, and all that, and new information, uh, new uh, concepts come in, and our uh, the way we treat companies can altogether be changed for the better, you know, the, the, for more effective uh, treatment. Like for example, the salmonellurias. We have different opinions regarding salmonellurias for quite a long time. Very, I'm in fact very grateful to you for elucidating us on those aspects. And another thing is that uh, you know, no matter how good a drug is, the final decisive factor is not the efficacy, not what the best the people can have, but in fact, very sadly, affordability and cost are the final decisive factor, especially for those of you who live in this part of the world and also for other visitors who have seen how we live, our circumstances will agree that. You know, we have to make a lot of compromise because if the patient said that cannot be afforded, if the patient simply say that this is uh, something that they find it difficult to get and use in the long run, then the, the uh, compliance will be effective. And eventually what they will do is they will go away from us and they will get treatment, treatment from elsewhere. There are other alternative groups of practitioners who may be very useful to our society and who may be doing wonderful things for a lot of ailments, but so far as diabetes is concerned, I personally believe that the only way this patient can survive less complication and all that is the kind of treatment that we are given. So it is very important that they believe in us and then that the, the treatment that we give be practical. And I think you will also remember that uh, the last 30 years or so, once upon a time, they said, I think there's a British group of scientists, I'm not sure. People who use metformin, the diabetes who use metformin, have greater incidence of cardiovascular events. And there was a period when, when the, the clinicians were very reluctant to use metformin. Later on, that was refuted in the British Medical Journal, pointing out to them the weaknesses that were present in that trial. And then very happily, we started to use metformin again. And nowadays, we have also known that in addition to hypoglycemic actions, metformin, after many years of usage, has now been known that it got other actions as well, not necessarily for diabetes, but for other things as well. So I would like to uh, 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 express my appreciation for Professor Tinswila and the coordinating committee for making this kind of national seminar a success and I, who have worked in the government uh, departments for quite a long time, actually understand how difficult it might have been for, for make this kind of thing happen, the efforts and time that they have put in. And then another thing is that uh, our distinguished lecturers, professor, diabeticians came from different parts of the region, different parts of the world, and they came here with a sense of goodwill. They came here with intention of actually uh, exchanging and contributing their knowledge, expertise, and experience for which we are very, very grateful. So on behalf of everybody, on behalf of our medical profession, I would like to thank all of you for coming here. And I also hope, explain that you will also come in later years to 
and, and then you know, uh, let's work together for the common good of the people. And I also uh, hope that you have a very pleasant stay in this country. And someone said, I think it was Professor Cooper, that this is your first visit here. So I think Professor this will that is highly responsible for making their stay very pleasant in this country and also give them an opportunity to see what should be seen, at least in Yapo. And also to all of you for, for coming here, contributing, and whatever that you need to do, so that we learn more from them, so that we'll be able to do more benefits to our patients now and also in the future. Thank you very much. Um, now, we are lucky that uh, we can afford to uh, we can we can afford to run question and answer session for about 15 minutes, plenty of time. So while we are having two eminent experts, you should make use of the opportunity by raising questions to clarify some queries and some doubts in the management of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Before that, um, I would like to uh, explain a bit about the prevalence of diabetes uh, of the Myanmar. And previously, uh, I was, uh, why uh, my, CR, my teacher uh, was the um, department, uh, director general of the Department of Medical Science. I was assigned by the government the duty responsibility for the project of prevention and control of diabetes, the ratio collaborative program in this country. And we found that the prevalence according to the, the ratio was around 2% and projected to be 3% in 2025. And we were surprised because based on our clinical practice, the prevalence might be more than that. So I have done a, a, a survey including both district and rural and urban area. And we found out that the prevalence was 11.84% in Yango Division, which is the most urbanized area of the country. Based on that finding, we have calculated and estimated the national prevalence, and it was uh, estimated as 6% for the country. However, uh, having a different geographical situation with various ethnic groups and various uh, cultural variation, we expect that the range is between 3% and 3% and, and 6%. Uh, township, one urban area, we have conducted a smaller scale study, purposely. This is the urban area in the Yango. And to our surprise, within six months, within six years, a study, what was the reason for that 2 to 3%? Previously, we were, we practiced the issue. And because they want to make an estimation of the prevalence of this country, they use the similar data from Vietnam, which they thought is similar to our country. But although by appearance we are similar, but by practice and by, by culture we are not identical. So when we did the real survey uh, prevalence, it was uh, at least six percent for the country. And we very, we very soon we're going to conduct additional survey uh, about to know the problem, uh, exact problem of the. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to carry out the question and answer session. Professor Nguyen, would you like to raise a question? Professor Taylor made I patient and uh, doctor. <coughs> and regarding your very convincing data indicating that saponary urea, urea that is like a site and uh, causes less uh, exhaustible to weaker cells or it almost equal to other uh, drugs. So what I would like to ask is in rationally thinking or physiological thinking if you are stimulating the cell on and on for quite a long period uh, it will be exhausted. That is the rational.
body mass index, if you look at it as an example, uh, the thinnest patients you would expect to have the lowest mortality, but you see a U-shaped curve, but it doesn't mean thinness causes death. It's just you have excess mortality. I think that would be the example I would use. The, the epidemiology supports the lower the A1C, the better, or the lower the, the mortality. A ret retrospective cohort analysis, and they divided into three groups, and they came up with seven feedback uh, figure of A1C, and they were saying that hemoglobin A1C about 6.5% uh, urine accepts this figure as the lower minimum. When you read a bit too low, we seem to see increase in mortality, but this is probably hypoglycemia. Although it's still controversial why, and they use a lot of different drugs, there are so many possibilities that low A1C is bad. With the drugs that we use, the hypoglycemia, con uh, concomitant uh, disease. So I think unless you did a classic trial where you used the same drug but titrated down to a lower dose in one group versus the other, I don't think you can answer that question. And I don't think that trial is going to be done. It's been done with lipid lowering agents where it's a little bit easier, where you give 80 milligrams versus 10 milligrams of, let's say, a torvastatin and you see a better effect with 80 milligrams. There I think you can answer it. We don't have drugs in diabetes where we are able to do that so easily. Maybe some of the newer drugs will be able to do that. But I would say you've got drug, population, age, comorbidities. It's too complicated. And epidemiology will not answer such a question. Great to meet you, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Charles Boyd, Dr. Bernie, Dr. Diabetes and Sunday Europe. Uh, actually, I've got two questions to ask. And my first question will go to Prof. Cooper. As you know that in treatment of diabetes, uh, metformin is still the first line in almost every kind of diabetes, the IDF, you have to cut it. But uh, in your slide, you mentioned that in some situations, you will use serpentine as a first line. So what I'd like to know is how did you sort of the patient who should receive serpentine as a first line? I mean, in UV diagnosis. Most of the people with type 2 diabetes have an elevated BMI. The average BMI in an American study will be 31. There won't be very many people here with a BMI of 31. So you have to translate data from very high BMI patients and assume that they will be the same in the Asian population. However, in the advanced study, many people were on glycoside MR alone and didn't have even metformin, particularly the Asian population, and they did very well. So what I'm saying is we don't really have an answer to your question, but we think that in people who are non-overweight, non-obese, with a lower BMI, we don't see such a big advantage of metformin over sulfonylureas. And with the safety that we've seen in the advanced study, we are comfortable that in some people you would consider an agent such as glycoside MR as first line. But we can't give you a very scientific answer we can only give you an anecdotal answer, building on some of the findings from trials which weren't designed really to answer your question. I don't think this question will ever be formally asked. What I can say to you in Japan, where we have a lot of people that have primarily a beta cell defect, there is a very strong trend away from using metformin as first line and using agents such as sulfonylurea or a DPP-4 inhibitor as first line. My own view of a DPP-4 as a first line is it's expensive, no proven outcome data, excellent side effect profile. But if I was spending money in this country, that's not the way I would first spend it. About the hypoglycemic effect of the saponine urea, and you said that glycoside is lesser than other saponine in terms of hypoglycemia. Um, the thing is, we have come across many cases particularly with the chronic renal insufficiency, they came to us hypoglycemic core, they were taking clinside MR. So what I prefer in this case is I put on ordinary clinside rather than clinside MR, because clinside MR has longer duration of action, particularly chronic renal insufficiency, more than you expect. What is your idea of it? As you're seeing from the slide, 
there's 2.7 percent of patients, the intensively treated patients, who did suffer severe hypoglycemia as defined by needing medical assistance. So there is still, there will still be patients who will have problems with hypoglycemia. It's a matter of, as you say, the appropriate titration, the appropriate dose adjustment, depending on the patient's renal impairment status. And as you say, the dimicron or the lithazide regular one might be an uh, uh, acceptable alternative because it's got a shorter half-life. But again, be very careful whenever you're dealing with patients with renal impairment. You can get hypoglycemia particularly. It's just that it's less compared to the other sulfonyl urease. Fortunately, when patients are significantly renal impaired, we have no option to use metformin in these individuals. So our hands are tied. There are very few options with regards to oral agents for achieving glucose targets in patients with renal impairment. So glipizide or glipizide would be the sulfonyl ureas of choice in these instances. Just yes, one, one minute. And the questions will go on, go to the Prophet Chan. That there is one interesting study on the uh, study on the uh, use of glipizide in the uh, remedial periods. We do have the practice of the as a Buddhist country. We have the Malta, they are having uh, some period, long period of fasting. Um, so we found out that there is no much difference when we are using the clinical side in these cases of uh, months with the fasting period. Um, I didn't have any detail of uh, contents in your study. That it, did you ever change the dose of the clinical side or the uh, timing or the root, root of the clinical side in using uh, the studies in the remittent period? Thank you. Um, from clinical experience, uh, we normally in patients who are on sulfonyl urea, particularly um, uh, dimicron MR, um, we change the timing of the dose that we give to them. We recommend, even though it is supposedly 24-hour profile, we change from morning dosing to at the time that they break fast. And so at least you actually minimize, to me, uh, the slightly peak potential of hypoglycemia uh, in these patients. And with regards to dose adjustment, certainly, I think it would be relevant and important to decide whether or not this patient does complain of hypoglycemia even in normal circumstances and in, uh, more so during the Ramadan month when they are fasting. And I usually commonly re recommend that they mo monitor their sugars with regard to during the fasting month, be ready to actually break the fast if they do uh, have hypoglycemic episodes and adjust the dose downwards, especially when patients tell me they cannot eat much when their stomach already contracted, they cannot use to eating so much. So th there is certainly a lot of flexibility that allows you to individualize your care. Thank you very much. Uh, both the speakers and the audience were very lively and very uh, active uh, section. Um, uh, although, as a chairperson, although I do have a few questions to raise uh, due to the constraint of time, I swallowed them up, making my time swollen again, you know. And uh, as a usual uh, way of appreciation to our speakers, shall we give a big round of claps? Before we hand over the section to the next, uh, as usual, manner. Um, we like to show